What's up, guys? My name is Tyler. Welcome to Mom's Basement MMA. And in this episode, we're going to preview and predict Tui Vasa versus Tybora. And let's get right into it. Without any further ado, I'm going to go right into the very first fight, and it's going to be a bantamweight contest between Chad and Hellinger going up against Shara Lampos. Gregorio, tough name to say, probably butchered it, but we do the best we can. Let's look into the contest the Canadian, the plus 170 underdog, and Gregorio, the minus 205 betting favorite. The thing with Gregorio, I'm just not sure how good this guy is, quite honestly. If you go back and you look at, at his resume and look at who he's been fighting on the regional scene, admittedly, not the best competition. The uh, fight against Chris Dis Disonel, he was in the red. Disonel, when this fight happened, he was 31 years old and he hadn't won an MMA fight since 2021. That's an important, that's like a big red flag to me. Um, not going up against the best competition, even on the regional scene. Um, the, the highlights about that fight, good low kicks from Gregorio. He did dominate the fight. He controlled Disonel in the clinch. But I just don't think a win over an opponent of that caliber really says a whole lot. Uh, about his prowess i just don't know how good he is the uh cameron smotherman fight he did show up though we have to give him credit for showing up to the smotherman fight he went in there he got the job done he was a big betting underdog i went with smotherman on this fight i thought smotherman was uh, the guy to get it done pretty bad loss for him in retrospect but we can't take anything away from uh, gregorio here he went there and he got it done and he's deservedly in the UFC by virtue of that performance alone. And he has a fight against the monster, Chad and Hellinger. This is a guy, honestly, I forgot about. I did not know he was still in the promotion. 37 years old and he's on a bit of a skid at the moment. A loss against Jose Johnson and then a loss against this dude right here. I'm not even going to try to say that name. We'll call him the Mongolian Knight. The uh, fight against Jose Johnson, he was a plus 160 underdog. There was a huge size difference between these two. And Ann Hellinger just got completely outmatched. He struggled with uh, Johnson's physicality. That was the big thing that uh, I remember from that fight. For this one against the Mongolian Knight, he just got beat up. Um, the Mongolian Knight hurt him multiple times in the first. And I thought it was a clear 30-27 for the Mongolian Knight. And Hellinger has shown me really nothing that suggests that he is on a UFC level. And arguably for Pompos, this is the easiest fight that he could possibly get. And Hellinger likely on the way out. This is a fight that Pompos Gregorio should be able to win. This is the caliber of fighter that he has fought on the regional scene many times. I don't think... I don't think him getting a win over Ann Hellinger is much of an ask. I think the UFC knows that. I think that's the reason why they put this fight together. And I'm going to predict that Gregorio gets this one done by decision. All right, guys, we move on to the strawweight division where Corey McKenna will be going up against Jackie Amarim. This one's a pick em fight. Uh, I looked at the odds earlier this week, and it was minus 115. A piece and really no significant changes since then. We see McKenna edging slightly toward being an underdog, but uh, it's about as even as it gets. For McKenna, this is her first fight back in roughly 18 months since she beat Cheyenne Velismus. And there's really been a litany of health issues with her. She's talked about contracting several viruses. I think she ended up getting the coronavirus as well and on top of all of her health issues uh some personal stuff in her life uh going on as well she ended up getting married i think to hector for i think uh that is her husband now but uh health challenges and then just you know life getting in the way of her mma career she'll be going up against jackie amarim jackie amarim is the uh former lfa strawweight champion and it's been a mixed bag since she's been in the promotion we saw her uh, rebound and get a win over ruiz very impressively but then she kind of fell flat against sam hughes um that is a fight that i've talked about in the past but a lot of people were uh betting on her to get the job done there and 
she kind of crashed and burned in her UFC debut. I wanted to go back and look at um, McKenna's most recent fight because it's just been a while since I've seen her. And um, what did surprise me is despite the layoff, she's still only 24. She's not going to be turning 25 until later this summer, as we see here. So I didn't realize she was uh, that young, but um, but she is. And that kind of threw me for a loop. Looking at her resume, this is what we see. We see a win over Cheyenne Velismus, a win over Miranda Granger, who uh, I believe is no longer with the promotion. I think she ended up actually retiring. And then um, we see her fall short against Elise Reed. Uh, been in the promotion uh, since 2020, beating Vanessa Demopoulos. And then we also see a win over Kay Hansen as well. Those two wins are actually notable, and we'll get into that for a second. But let's talk about this fight against Velismus. It was a grappling-heavy game plan. She cut off the cage. She made Velismus clinch with her and clocked a lot of time with that uh, clinch control. She also had a lot of top control in that fight as well. But that was a fight that overall she ended up winning two rounds to one against Felismus. Uh, pretty clear 29-28 decision, in my opinion. Probably one of the more impressive wins of her career. I went. I also went back and I watched the uh, Granger fight as well, just for a reference. And she completely dominated the first. A nice high crotch takedown in this fight. She threatens the Von Flew choke at the end of the first. I thought she was about ready to uh, lock in that submission and get the dub, but the uh, time expires in the very first round. But she does get the Von Flew in the second. And let's go to the other side. Let's talk about uh, Jackie Amarim. Very impressive from the LFA circuit. That's where I know her. I've seen her. I saw her fight Ashley Nichols uh, not that long ago, and then we see what she's done in the past leading up to that admittedly not going up against the best competition, but getting these girls out of there or in the first round, that's what ended up uh, getting her the platform. That's what ended up getting her into the UFC is her dominance over lesser competition. It didn't work out in that Sam Hughes fight though. Um, I've talked about that fight before. She was a minus 220. She was a minus 255 betting favorite going into that one, but I did want to watch it again. Somebody in the comments had had uh, mentioned that Sam Hughes grabbed Amarine's glove over the course of that fight that staved off a submission attempt, and I didn't catch that. So I went back and I watched the tape, and that's absolutely true. So whoever in the comments said that, you're absolutely right. I missed that. Uh, there is a definite glove grab, and who knows, had the ref um actually caught that there is a possibility that Jackie Amarim would have choked out Sam Hughes with a rear naked choke in any event there definitely should have been a point deduction the ref definitely uh bungled uh that one so kind of food for thought there the uh this fight against Ruiz complete domination she outclassed Ruiz across all of the rounds and when i think about Jackie Amarim I think about a very competent grappler. I think about somebody whose jujitsu prowess has to be taken seriously and look at her record. This is how she ends up getting fights done. Um, in the past, she's been able to leverage that jujitsu and find the finishes. Make no mistake about it. This is a fight that's going to play out on, on the ground predominantly. This is going to be a grapple heavy match. I do not expect McKenna to approach Jackie Amarim any differently than she does all of her other fights. Keep in mind, she is very compromised in the reach department. 58 and a half inch reach. I think that is like among the shortest, if not the shortest in the entire promotion. She is going to need to pressure Amarim and get this fight down to the ground. And that's what I think is going to end up happening. Despite Amarim being a black belt in jiu-jitsu, I do not expect Corey McKenna to approach her any differently. And in her past, she has experience going up against highly technical, highly proficient grapplers. And two of them, Vanessa Demopoulos, and then there's Kay Hansen, who's no longer with the promotion, but a competent grappler in her own right. So I'm bringing that up because she has shown that 
against grapplers. She isn't going to be deterred from her game plan. Now, I am not saying that Amarim is in the in the ballpark of Demopolis and Hanson. I think I definitely think Amarim's better than both of those two. I do think Corey McKenna is going to come out on top. The thing about Amarim, if she wins this fight, it's likely going to be by submission. But I do think that McKenna's pressure is going to make the difference. I do think that McKenna's top control is going to make the difference. And that's why I have her winning this fight. We've seen Amarim struggle a little bit off of her back. Um, she is competent. She'll look for those submissions. But it's kind of an all or nothing thing. And I like Corey McKenna's top control. I think it's going to make a huge difference in this fight. And I am going to be leaning with Corey McKenna. Hopefully I can get her at plus money. But uh, all in all, I like her body of work. I think I like her um, resume. I like the Cage Warriors experience. I like the fact that she's gone up against fighters like Demopolis, fighters like Hanson. I like her overall body of work. It is a risk, of course, because she's been out of action for 18 plus months. But I'm okay pulling the trigger on Corey McKenna. Um, this was a fight, as soon as they announced it, I thought to myself, like, she's going to tap into her grappling. I'm not expecting her to approach this any different from any of her other fights. I think her top control is going to make a huge difference. I'm going to go with Corey McKenna to get this one done by decision. Moving on to the featherweight division, Australia's Josh Kulibau will be going up against Danny Silva in a featherweight contest. Josh Kulibau, the minus 180 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Danny Silva, plus 150. Kulibal dropped his last fight against Lerone Murphy. And prior to that, he gets a rear naked choke victory over Melsik Bagdasarian. And Sungwoo Choi, he ends up edging that one out by split decision. Danny Silva is a newcomer to the UFC. He fought a really uh, exciting fight against Angel Pacheco not that long ago. And then a lot of wins on the uh, regional circuit as well, as you can see here. Murphy fight was a, a bit interesting. One of the things that I noticed when I went back and I watched this fight is I really liked Murphy's game plan quite a bit. He stepped back to the cage and drew Kulibau in, and then he would uh, clinch him up and then reverse position and then force Kulibau to grapple with him. And that's the thing about uh, Josh Kulibau, a very good striker. He is somebody that's gotten actually a lot of uh, preferable matchups. When you look at like his entire body of work here, we, we see him going up against guys that uh, stylistically are good fits for him. Like Charles Jourdain, he's a uh, competent striker, as we all know. But uh, for somebody like Josh Kulibau, that's a favorable matchup. Melsic Bagdasarian, another favorable matchup for him because he likes to stand and he likes to strike. And then we saw him get exposed a little bit in this uh, Lerone Murphy fight. We saw Lerone Murphy, hey, you're not just going to take the distance. I'm not going to let. I'm not going to give you the distance the entire time. I will threaten level changes. I will threaten the clinch with you. And those are the things that you need to do when you fight somebody like Coley Bao. If you just, if you give him distance, if you give him time to operate, that's where he thrives. That's where he looks good. And uh, we'll see how that uh, we'll see how this fight works out when he goes up against Danny Silva. When I think of Danny Silva, I think of two things. I think of pressure and I think of boxing. Um, this guy is relentless with the pressure. And we definitely saw that with the Angel Pacheco fight. He stood in Pacheco's face the entire time. And he just these two just traded um, with boxing combinations. It was essentially a boxing fight um, for most of it. I'm curious to see how he's going to approach somebody like Josh Kulibau like that. I would expect Kulibau to really attack the low kicks on Danny Silva. I would expect him to use his footwork to try to stave off that pressure. I want to know if Danny Silva is going to tap into his catch wrestling background at all over the course of this fight. If he does, he might actually end up pulling this fight out. And at plus 150 odds, it is slightly tempting, but um, I am going to go with uh, Josh Kulibau to get this one done by decision. I don't know if he knocks out Danny Silva. Um, Silva might surprise me if he taps into the wrestling, but I just haven't seen the wrestling lately. I didn't. We didn't see it in the Pacheco fight, and then we didn't see it in this fight as well. He didn't need to use it in the Ortega fight, but I kind of figured he would uh, 
tap into that wrestling a little bit more. When I think of his coach, when I think of uh, the den, I, it's not called this anymore. Uh, I think of people that are competent grapplers, competent wrestlers, and we just really haven't seen that. So I'm curious what the game plan is going to look like. If this stands, if this is a striking fest, Cooley Bow's uh, striking is going to edge out Danny's boxing, in my opinion. Um, minus 180, I don't know if I'm going to get behind that or not. I have to kind of see if I'm going to bet on Josh Cooley Bow. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to. But um, I do think for prediction purposes, Josh Koibau gets this one done by decision. Okay, guys, we move on to the lightweight division where Tiago Moises will be going up against Mitch Ramirez. A bit of a change up here. This was a uh, fight where Brad Riddell was supposed to make his return, but he ends up pulling out. And uh, enter one Rich Ramirez, who's taken this fight on short notice. Let's talk a little bit about Tiago Moises. He, uh, first off, I don't know what the betting lines look like for this fight. Uh, they're not listed on Tapology. I did check my book. There still aren't any lines here, but I'm going to go ahead and presume that Tiago Moises is probably going to be the betting favorite for this one. Keep in mind, this is a short notice fight. I would expect Ramirez to come in at a minimum around plus 150, could be higher, but it's a complete shot in the dark. I don't know what the lines look like. So this is something that you guys are going to have to monitor for yourselves as we get closer to the fight. Tiago Moises, 17 and 7. He uh, falls short in his most recent fight. That, of course, happened against Benoit Saint-Denis. Prior to that, he has wins over Melk Costa and a win over Christos Gallegos. For uh, Mitch Ramirez... He uh, fights Arian Tavares in LFA, and then prior to that, he fought Carlos Pratas on uh, Dana White Contender Series. That fight happened at uh, welterweight, keep in mind, and so we are back down to lightweight for Ramirez. I think that's an uh, important factor to think about. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, Ramirez for a second. This is a guy that a lot of people aren't going to um, probably pay too much mind to. They're going to see that this is a uh, late-notice replacement, a guy from the regional scene um, who struck out on Dana White Contender Series. So I'm expecting a lot of people to uh, kind of be, dismiss be dismissive of this guy. But here are a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, he's based out of Las Vegas. He fights out of Syndicate MMA. So this being a short-notice fight in the Apex isn't really a huge concern to me. He's right there. He's got all the resources. The people at the front desk of the PI probably know who Mitch Ramirez is. He's probably there every week anyway. The fact that this is a lightweight fight, that doesn't that doesn't really concern me either, considering he fought his most recent fight after the protest fight. He fought that fight at a uh, lightweight as well. Bam. There you go. It's right there. 155. And this guy that he fought, Tavares, a bad dude. He was undefeated at the at this point in time, and Ramirez just absolutely sparked him with uh, a hook, and he ended up winning the fight. And that's, guys, that's what Mitch Ramirez does. This guy's striking power has to be respected. And if you watch uh, regional MMA, some of these names are going to be familiar. This is a very good win against an undefeated guy in Tavares. Ayadi Majidin, beast. Um, people don't put away Majidine too often. And I know he's not exactly a household name, but look at the record, 14 and 4. And he is a guy, is very dangerous, as you can see here. And in this fight, I remember him uh, fighting Eric Sanchez in this fight at uh, A110 last year. And he choked out Sanchez. And had he made the weight, he would have been the uh, champion for uh, A1 combat, but he ended up uh, missing weight and uh, that didn't end up working out for him. But as you can see here, he's been on a tear uh, ever since uh, dropping that fight against Ramirez. So that's a, a solid win. Uh, going going further down, Ryder Newman, he's another guy that they're really trying to build up. Um, he fights him in his, uh, UF, in his professional debut. And uh, this is a guy that's in uh, that fights on Tough Enough and he's had a ton of success too, an extreme couture guy. And boom, you could see there uh, quite a bit of success for uh, Newman as well, despite falling short against Tra Treshawn Gore. 
uh, a couple years back. So when I look at Ramirez and I look at what he's done, um, I can't help but be a little bit impressed by him. Now, the uh, Prates fight, um, he had his flashes, but, I mean, you lose to Prates on contender, that's really not the worst look to me. And um, I think he definitely made up for that when you consider the wins over Majidine, when you consider the wins over Tavares, when you consider the win over Newman. Like, this is a guy that's gotten it done time and time again on the regional circuit. And he'll be going up against Tiago Moises. Moises, 17 and 7. I've called him a journeyman fighter before, um, but that's exactly what he is. And I don't mean that uh, disrespectfully. Um, but here's the thing about him like, he will beat the mid competition. But we see time and time again, um, they push him up, and that's where he falls short. Now, you lose to Benoit Saint Denis, not the biggest deal. Uh, he loses against Joel Alvarez. He loses to Islam. He loses to Demir Ismagulov, who's pretty good. He uh, lost to Benel Dariush. So this is the guy that they um, put out. They, they've tried to push him in the past, and then um, for whatever reason, it just doesn't really work out for him. Um, Melk Costa, that's a very uh, good win, but also keep in mind that Costa ended up taking that fight on short notice. Uh, that was the way he, that was how he ended up getting into the promotion. So I don't know how much stock we can really put into that. And Melk Costa, this is a guy that um, I was really high on. He did phenomenal in uh, in the LFA and just really hasn't looked all that great um, it, it, since he's been in the UFC. We see a win over Austin Lingo, uh, and then he ended up getting uh, finished by Steve Garcia. Probably not the best look there. So I just don't know uh, how much stock I can put into the Costa fight, all things considered. And then the uh, fight against uh, Christian Gallegos, another journeyman fighter, who I don't even know if he's in the promotion anymore oh no i'm i'm lying yeah he's fighting ignacio bahamondes later so i take that back apologies to the spartan when i look at this one there's i again i'm expecting a lot of people to be on moises for this one but i'm just not that impressed with him quite honestly but guys i'm going with mitch ramirez i know that uh, it's a short notice fight and i know that there are some risks with that but i think tiago moises is a really beatable guy i don't think he's that great um, he's got solid grappling. He is definitely a submission threat, but I like Mitch Ramirez's body of work. I like that he, uh, comes in hot. I like that he's a bit of a banger and he puts people away with the strike. And we've seen it time and time again. I'm expecting him to be a significant dog, but I'm okay taking a chance with this. Normally I would fade a short notice guy, but, um, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal for him. I don't think it's a huge ask. For him to step on the scale, make the weight, and perform. We're not flying across the country. And this guy trains out of syndicate MMA, so he should have all of the resources that he needs in order to put on a good performance. And um, it's a bit of a redemption for him. He lo he falls short against Pratas. He gets another shot. And um, I'm expecting him to really take advantage of that and show up. And I think he has um, a beatable opponent in Tiago Moises, quite, quite frankly. We're not asking him to go up and uh, fight somebody like Benoit Saint-Denis in his UFC debut. We're not asking him to fight somebody like Dan Hooker in his UFC debut. It's Tiago Moises, and uh, this is a very beatable opponent, in my opinion. And I'm going to say that Mitch Ramirez figures out a way to finish this fight. I'm, I'm going to say it happens in the second round. We move on to the flyweight division, where Ode Osborne will be going up against Jafael Filio. Osborne, the plus 145 betting underdog, and then Filio, the minus 175 favorite. For Ode Osborne, he's been treading water in his uh, UFC career to date. He's gone four. He's four and four thus far in his UFC career. He has two wins over active fighters. All four of his losses, though, I would say they're against solid opposition. He has uh, a loss against Tyson Nam. He has a loss against Almabayev. He loses to Manel Cobb, and then he loses to Brian Kelleher. Keep in mind that was back in 2020, and um, that was his UFC debut. And at that time, Brian Kelleher, that's kind of a tough fight um, to, to fight against somebody with that much experience. So um, not a huge surprise that he fell short in that one. 
But let's look at uh, his most recent performances. This one against Almabayev, he was a plus 160 dog. He gets taken down, and then we saw Almabayev control him and uh, get him in a Peruvian necktie. Um, but he's able to uh, escape that, but he gets taken down again. They start grappling. He gives up his back to Almabayev, and then he ends up getting uh, choked out in the second round. Amabayev is a pretty special dude. We saw him get it done um, most recently. Amabayev is a pretty special dude, and I think he's going to end up winning later on uh, when he fights CJ Fergara. So probably not the worst loss to take. I think that one's going to age pretty well for him. The uh, Charles Johnson fight, he was a plus 135 underdog, and it was a close fight. I had it a clear first round for Osborne and a clear second round for Johnson. So this fight really ultimately comes down to how you scored the third. What do you rate higher, Johnson striking or Osborne's grappling? I leaned toward Charles Johnson for this fight when I watched the uh, fight for the second time, and so did the live odds. But um, again, it was a close fight, and uh, the judges ultimately decided that uh, Osborne was the right guy for this one. Again, I had it for Johnson slightly, but uh, I really wasn't too upset at this one. I can understand why some people would go with uh, Osborne, so I definitely can't call it a robbery. And then prior to that, he ends up getting finished by Tyson Nam. But Tyson Nam, again, that's not the uh, worst loss to take. Tyson Nam's a tough dude and uh, very powerful and uh, one of those tricky guys to have to go up against. So I don't really uh, – I look at his losses here, guys, and I'm just really not that concerned considering the uh, competition, to be uh, quite frank. Let's go to the other side. Let's talk about Filio. This is a guy – um, that uh, made it into the promotion by beating Roy Echeverria on Contender a few years back. Um, yep, it was right here in 2022. They feed him to Mohamed Mokeyev, and that fight goes pretty much how you would expect it to. He ends up getting strangled by uh, Mohamed Mokeyev. Not the worst loss to take. And then most recently, he fights Daniel Barrez uh, in July of 2023. Now, this guy I had never even heard of when this fight uh, was announced. I want to say he was a, a short notice replacement. Yeah, he replaced uh, Joseph Morales, and then you can see before um, he 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 lost to Carlos Hernandez on Contender, and then he would he was fighting on the regional scene, and so he is a short notice replacement. I had to uh, rewatch the tape, and I just was not impressed by Filio at all. Uh, I I thought he looked like I thought he looked uh, terrible in that matchup. Uh, I wasn't impressed. I, he did not look comfortable whatsoever on the feet. Uh, and we saw Barrez have uh, success against him initially. Eventually, he's able to initiate some grappling and then get feel, uh, get Barrez in a triangle choke. Uh, but I thought that there was a lot to be desired for Filio. And I'm looking at this fight in minus 175 for Filio. I just can't get behind that at all. I don't like this guy very much. I don't think he's that great. And uh, I know Osborne isn't great either. But um, this is the side that I'm leaning on, actually. I think uh, Osborne is probably being overlooked here a little bit. I know he's not that great. I know his record's not that great. But you know what? I can forgive him a little bit. You lose to Amabayev. Well, you were brought in to lose. Not the big, Not the biggest deal. Uh, you you get knocked out by, against Tyson Nam again. Not the biggest deal. You lose to Manel Cop. Okay. So he does beat some of the uh, lower level guys, as you see here. And um, when I look at everything, I immediately was leaning toward Osborne. I think Osborne striking is way better than uh, Filio. I think Filio is a little bit of a one trick pony. And um, I just cannot do Filio at minus 175. I think that's absolutely crazy. Guys, I'm going the other way for this one. I'm going to go with the dog in Ode Osborne. I say he gets it done. By decision, I think his striking is going to make the difference in this fight. So uh, plus 145 for Ode Osborne. That's how I will be going uh, for this contest. Josiani Nunez will be going up against Chelsea Chandler. Nunez, the minus 150 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Chandler, plus 125. There's been a lot of volatility on this line. Nunez opened up initially at plus 120, and now the lines have shifted, and now she is the uh, betting favorite. Also, keep in mind that this fight is happening at bantamweight, 135 pounds. Both of these uh, ladies have competed at featherweight previously. 
Let's start with Nunez. She's 3-0 in the UFC. She's got a pretty record. That 10-1 and record, it looks pretty, but you start digging into her and looking at who some of these wins have come across, have come against, and trash can opposition, quite honestly. Um, she's She really has yet to fight anybody legitimate. Ramona Pasquale, no longer in the promotion. Uh, Zara Farn, she was like 41 years old, and she took this fight, and uh, you can't put away a 41-year-old fighter. The other thing to think about is she's like five feet tall. She's competing in a weight class with everyone that's going to significantly outsize her. And when she goes up against serious competition, she, it's probably best to fade her. I don't think she's as good as what her record indicates. Um, but I will say this to her credit. She's pretty long for being somebody who is uh, so short, a 67 inch reach. That's pretty long for somebody her size. And she has fought the uh, taller girls. Before, uh, Farn and pa Pasquale, she was able to connect with the striking despite the uh, despite that height uh, issue. Uh, she was able to connect and uh, tag both of these opponents repeatedly. The Ramona Pasquale fight, she uh, outboxed Ramona. Ramona just really struggled with the pressure in this fight, and uh, Nunez just could not miss with that left. What was concerning, though, was Ramona Pasquale was able to get three takedowns off of her in this fight, and Nunez's takedown defense is listed at 70%. I don't know if I believe that whatsoever, and that's the concern against somebody like Chelsea Chandler. Chelsea Chandler, you could expect a very predictable game plan, expect her to pressure, expect her to want to take this fight down to the ground, and there's no other way to uh, say this. If Chelsea Chandler cannot get this fight down to the ground, she is going to lose. She is terrible on her feet. She uh, looks very shaky. Her guard is going to be down the entire time. And we've seen her get clipped multiple times. The uh, Norma Dumont fight, this was the meme fight where she runs away. And Jacob Montalvo had every right to wave this fight off for timidity. You cannot turn your back uh, on your opponent. And if you do, the fight gets called in my opinion every single time we saw uh dumont just really tee off on chandler with the uh, striking combinations and piece her up in order for her to win she needs to be able to grapple so i think she's uh, a little bit one-dimensional and this was a fight against story Olenko that was probably favorable to her because we know what story Olenko does uh, she goes for she spams that arm bar and she's going to want to grapple with you but this win here just i don't really it was somewhat predictable i think i just stayed away from this fight when this one happened chandler has a much more limited path to victory like she needs to grapple she needs to be able to get this fight down to the ground in order to win now nuñez the takedown defense is probably not as advertised but she's so bad on the feet she looks really uncomfortable i've seen her get tagged in almost every single one of her fights at, even at plus 125 against an opponent with a padded record who isn't that great. I can't do Chelsea Chandler. I don't think she's a UFC caliber fighter, to be quite honest. She's strong. She's got the grappling. Too much of a vulnerability on the feet. I think Josiani Nunez is the right pick here. I'm going to look for her to get it done. I say uh, Nunez uh, figures out a way to finish Chandler. I say it happens in the second round. I'm going to be going with uh, Nunez to get this one done, either by ground and pound finish or by uh, TKO. All right, guys, we move on this time to the lightweight division where Mike Davis will be going up against Natan Levy. Both of these fighters have not been in the cage since 2022, so uh, a bit of a layoff for both of these guys. Mike Davis, the minus 250 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Levy, plus 205. For Mike Davis, his most recent fight was against uh, Shapa Claus. Vyacheslav Borsho, uh, and it was a pretty dominant fight, and he came close to ending this fight in the first, and um, he went on to win convincingly in rounds two and three as well. He um, did get two takedowns in this fight and was able to maintain top control. A very, a very impressive performance by Mike Davis in this fight. And then prior to that, he has a win over Mason Jones. Uh, this fight was back on Fight Island, and it was over three years ago, so I don't want to deep dive too much into that one, but notable because that was the very first loss of uh, Mason Jones's career. 
And then, of course, uh, Mason Jones is no longer in the promotion. He elected to not re-sign with the UFC, but uh, I expect Mason Jones to resurface here in short order. He's uh, having a lot of success in his second stint in Cage Warriors, so that's a name to kind of keep in the back of your mind. I think he will boomerang back into the UFC. Let's talk about uh, his opponent for a little bit, Natan Levy. Um, this is a guy he was paired up with Pete Rodriguez um, most recently, and then those bouts never ended up materializing because of uh, Rodriguez's weight issues. He also was pulled out of a few fights on uh, his en on his end as well. Let's talk a little bit about this Valdez fight. He had a lot of success in this one. He was a minus 200 uh, betting favorite, and he absolutely teed off on Valdez. He uh, nearly got him out of there uh, on two different occasions in the first round. Very slick striking. You can, you can see that this guy comes from a striking background. I want to say he's a uh, karate black belt. This is a fight, quite honestly, I was a little surprised at this matchup because this is a guy, uh, Natan Levy, They've been giving him some really um, preferable matchups, and they've been trying to build this guy up a little bit, so it would seem, based off of the fight against Mike Breeden, based off of a fight against Gennaro Valdez. So I was a little surprised that they would uh, throw him up uh, against Mike Davis. The uh, concern here is the layoff. We don't really know what either guy is going to look like, but I am going to go with Mike Davis for this fight because, number one, I thought he fought a somewhat similar guy in Shava Claus here and under similar circumstances, there was a huge layoff here as well. It was like a two year layoff when he took this fight against a striker and he did well. He actually dominated. I'm not going to get cute with this one. I like Natan Levy. I think he's a talented guy, but I think stylistically um, Mike Davis is probably going to be a tough out for him. I do think that uh, Mike Davis has, uh, is the more well-rounded fighter and at minus 250, that does seem a little steep to me, but I am going to go off of history here a little bit. And Mike Davis, he's still relatively young. He's only 31 years old. He's actually younger than Levy. I, I, I am going to trust in Mike Davis to get this one done. Kind of a strange matchup. I don't think it's a preferable matchup stylistically for Natan Levy. Natan Levy, I don't hate it. If you guys like Natan Levy and at plus 205, you know, my suggestion would be to wait. I think you could probably end up getting Natan Levy at probably closer to plus 250 as we get closer to the fights. I don't hate the idea of uh, betting Levy as a betting underdog, and that's something that I'll keep in mind. I'm going to wait to see. If, if I can get him in the, uh, like, plus 250 or above, that might be something I'll entertain. But for uh, prediction purposes, guys, I'm going to go with Mike Davis. And right now, my answer would be, uh, you're you're looking at a potential parlay candidate here for Davis, in my opinion. This is a fight that he should be able to win. We move on to the middleweight division where Gerald Mearshart will be going up against Brian Barbarina. Gerald Mearshart, the minus 190 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Brian Barbarina, plus 160. For um, Mearshart, 35 and 17, been around for a long time. I remember him from Rufus Sport. He's no longer there. He trains out of Killcliff FC with a few other people that... Uh, I know. Um, for a mere chart, 36 years old, so probably on the tail end of his career and uh, kind of on a brutal stretch right now. A loss against Andre Petrosky, and then, of course, a loss against Joe Pfeiffer. The last win he has on his resume was against Bruno Silva, and that was back in August of 2022. He ends up getting a guillotine choke. He goes up against Brian Barbarena, 18-11 and 11 record. Brian Barberina is still only 34 years old. That was somewhat surprising when I was uh, doing my tapology scrub on him earlier. I thought he was a little bit older than that, but that is definitely not the case. Brian Barberina, pretty straightforward. We know what he likes to do. It's uh, pretty much kill or be killed. Uh, 11 wins have come by knockout. Uh, similar to GM3, kind of a rough stretch for him. Uh, and he's kind of been uh, served up for RDA, Gunnar Nelson, and then Mahmoud Muradov. Uh, his last win was against the legend Robbie Lawler back in July of 2022. So we have GM three put in a position where he can get one back for his, uh, uh, for uh, the legend Robbie Lawler. Cause of course, Robbie was a uh, kill cliff FC guy for many years. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Murata fight. This was a complete route. All three judges scored this one 30-27 for Muradov. 
He took Barbarina down 13 times in that fight. Brian Barbarina is either going to spark GM3 or GM3 is going to be able to get this fight down to the ground and get a submission. So it, it really comes down to like, which one do you think is more probable? Do you like Brian Barbarina for a knockout? Because if you do, I think plus 160 is way too low. I don't like those odds at the mo at the moment. You're going to have to look and see what a prop for a knockout will get you. That is the only way Brian Barbarina wins this fight. Now, that's the thing with GM3. He can get sparked, and we've seen it happen before. Four losses by knockout. And we saw Joe Pfeiffer knock him out. We saw Hamzat knock him out. We've seen Ian Heinish knock him out. And um, we've seen him get grounded and pounded by Tiago Santos. So it can be done. It's not the most unrealistic thing in the world. And in my mind, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, wow, like, GM3, glass chin. But that's really not true. Like, you know, it was just kind of recency bias on my part is why I thought that. Um, but um, in any event, he's only been knocked out four times. But it definitely can be happened. And then, of course, you see uh, three quick knockouts in the first round. But he's got a ton of fights under his belt. G GM3 at minus 190. Uh, I'm okay with that, actually. I, I know that GM3, there is a possibility he could end up getting knocked out by Brian Barberina, and it would not be the most surprising thing in the world to me, but I think there's a huge difference in the grappling and wrestling between these two. And if Brian Barberina gets taken down at all, he is absolutely screwed. And I'm going to trust in GM3's takedowns. I'm going to trust in his grappling, and I'm going to trust in that submission offense to get this one done. I say GM3 figures out a way to submit Brian Barbarino. I say it happens in the second round and at minus 190. Uh, I'm okay um, betting on this one. It might be a little bit of a risk here, but Brian Barbarino at plus 160, that's still way too low for me. And I really can't entertain the idea of him going up against somebody like GM3. I just think it's a huge mismatch for him. I think stylistically, that's a nightmare for somebody like Brian Barbarino. I don't mind Barbarina as an underdog going up against another brawler, going up against another striker, but Gerald Mearshart is a competent grappler. That's going to make the difference in this fight. I think he's going to outclass Brian Barbarina in the wrestling and grappling, and I'm, I'm okay betting on GM3 to get that one done. All right, guys, we move on to the bantamweight division where Panny Kianzad will be going up against Macy Shasan. This fight will be happening at 135 pounds. Kianzed is the number six ranked bantamweight contender, and then Shasan, the 10th ranked bantamweight contender. Results really have not been there for either one of these fighters as of late. We see uh, their wins sandwiched between two uh, kind of bad losses. There's a uh, submission. Uh, uh, Macy gets uh, submitted by Raquel Pennington here, and then she uh, gets knocked out against uh, Irene Aldana. And then for Kianzad, a loss against Raquel Pennington and then a loss against Ketlin Vieira. So kind of struggling um, at this point in their careers. They're both pretty desperate for a win. We see Kianzad, the uh, plus 145 dog, and then Macy Shasan, the uh, minus 175 betting favorite. I want to talk about this uh, fight against Vieira for Kianzad. Um, Vieira basically clocks Kianzed, gets her down to the ground. This is a very boring fight. And um, we just saw Vieira completely outclass Panny Kianzed with the wrestling and the grappling. I personally had her winning every single round 30 27. In this fight against Landsberg, she, Panny Kianzed, was a minus 450 betting favorite. And keep in mind, Landsberg was 40 years old at that time. So uh, really no surprise to me that uh, Kianzed would uh, win that fight. She ended, It ended up going to a decision, but I did think it was a 29-28. I did give Landsberg one of those rounds. You know, I'm just not quite sure where I uh, put Panny Kianzed in the pecking order of things. Uh, Macy Chasson, this fight against Irene Aldana, um, kind of a freak finish. Now, she almost got finished in the first round, but she really worked Aldana in the second. And things were looking good. And then she uh, 
gets kicked right on the liver. It was a freak kind of thing. I've never seen anything happen like that before. Aldania's on her back, and she just throws up an, an up kick that lands absolutely perfectly. Kind of a terrible way to uh, lose a fight if you're Shasun, but hey, that's MMA for you. The uh, fight against Norma Dumont, this was a very close fight. And in fact, going into the third, I had this uh, at a round apiece. And to me, in the third round, I actually had Dumont taking it. I thought she uh, did the more significant damage over the course of this fight. And uh, Chasson basically just clinched her against the cage. And two judges had this one 30-27 for Macy. And uh, I thought that was very suspect, in my opinion. And in fact, I, I gave this fight to Norman Dumont. So for all intents and purposes, I have Macy Shaw on, on a three-fight losing skid at the moment. Loss against Pennington. I chalked this up as a loss. And Aldania, of course, that was a loss too. So Shaw definitely needs a result here, for sure. The one thing that scares me about this fight is the inactivity for Shaw That is a huge concern and I like Macy. I think she's a talented fighter. She's still really young. She's a good size for the weight class. I like her wrestling. I like her grappling. I like her striking. I think she's a complete mixed martial artist, but I don't like the time away. The re- I don't like, I don't like the recent results and she needs to like prove something to me. She needs to get an authoritative win. And it seems to me like she has an opportunity to do that against somebody like Keon Zed. Guys, I don't think Keon Zed's that great. Honestly, I, I don't. I've never really been super impressed with her. None of her wins really uh, leap out on the paper to me. I mean, Landsberg's not around anymore. I don't think Alexis Davis is. I think she's retired. I think she has. Let's make sure I'm... Okay, yeah, her last fight was in 2022. Uh, Sajara Eubank, she's not with the promotion anymore. Correa, she's retired. Um, Jessica, Jessica Rose Clark, she's no longer with the promotion. I know Macy choked her out in 2018. I don't know if she does that again, though, in this fight. Um, I'm still going to go with Macy Shasson. I think that's the right pick for this one, but I say she gets it done by decision. The inactivity does scare me a little bit. I'm not quite sure what she's going to look like going into this fight. I'll say Macy wins this one by decision, but minus 175, uh, that's kind of borderline for me. I still have to think about if I'm going to bet on her or not to get this one done. This might be a fight that we're better off just kind of uh, not betting on just because of that inactivity. But if the Macy Shasson that I know shows up, This should be a fight that she should be able to win. All right, guys, we move on to the next fight on the card. Christian Rodriguez will be going up against Isaac Dulgarian. Notice this is a featherweight fight. So we see Christian Rodriguez basically getting kicked out of the bantamweight division and forced to fight in the featherweight division because he can't make weight at 135 pounds. No surprises here, guys. We knew this was coming. Uh, A pretty horrific weight miss against Cameron Simon not that long ago. And then he missed against Roal Rusas Jr. as well. So we all knew this was coming. Should come as no surprise to anybody that um, the move up to 145 pounds was eminent. So it is a new weight class for Christian Rodriguez. That is worth mentioning. C-Rod, since uh, losing his first fight in the UFC against Pierce, this guy has been very impressive to me. We saw the uh, submission win against Joshua Weems the uh, win against Royal Rosas Jr. and then the win against Cameron Simon. Um, the the uh, Rosas Jr. fight, I've talked about this one before. He got backpacked in the first round, but then he made the adjustments and had a convincing win over Rosas Jr., turned it on him in round rounds two and three and basically outgrappled Rosas Jr. in order to uh, get the win. The Simon fight, he was four pounds over. So a horrific weight miss. Simon should not have taken this fight uh, because of how heavy Rodriguez was. I thought it was a poor decision on his part to take that fight, and I'm sure he regrets it in retrospect. But Rodriguez mostly dominated this fight. He outgrappled and outstruck Simon. I would probably give the first round to Simon, but a clear uh, rounds two and three 
to uh, C Rod. That's how I had it on my card. He'll be going up against Isaac Dulgarian. Now, there's a ton of hype around this guy, undefeated fighter, and we can understand why. Uh, trains out of Factory X, which is a uh, very good gym uh, based out of Denver. And look at what he's been able to accomplish since he turned pro. Um, here on the regional scene, he just tears through all of his opponents and is making quick work of uh, everybody. And then he gets an opportunity to fight Francis Marshall, and he uh, gets Francis Marshall out of there in the very first round. Francis Marshall, no joke. We know uh, what this guy brings to the table, a very tough guy. He got a takedown. He maintained the top control in that fight against Marshall. And once he got it, he never let it go. He cracked open Marshall, gets the TKO victory. Very, very impressive. Two young studs going up against each other. Um, the latest odds, plus 110 for C-Rod and then minus 135 for Dilgarian. The odds really have not changed much since I last looked at this one. Dilgarian's a stud. And I get the hype. But he's only 6-0 and still. And if I can get C-Rod, I know it's a new weight class, but uh, C-Rod at plus 110, guys, uh, that to me is worth the gamble. Um, I think he's the more proven commodity. He's got the experience. He's got the wins over the better competition right now. We've seen him out-grapple grapplers. We've seen him out-strike strikers. The one critique about C-Rod is the scale. If you can get past the scale, he looks great. I'm going to take Christian Rodriguez in this fight as a dog. As a plus 110 dog, I'm kind of surprised that uh, he is not the betting favorite, but people must be skittish because it's a new weight class, and uh, we can't take anything away from Isaac Dolgarian. It was a very impressive performance in the uh, most recent outing, but two back-to-back -back very impressive performances for C-Rod as well. I mean, how can you not be impressed by what he did against Rosas Jr.? And how can you not be impressed against what he did against Simon? Um, I'm taking C-Rod. I think he's a special fighter. He needs to get his weight under control. I don't know how I feel about his long-term future in the featherweight division. 5'7 seems kind of short for featherweight. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, he seems very technical, very proficient, a, 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 a complete freestyle fighter. I've been very impressed with C-Rod. And I am going – I'm okay – taking a chance on Rodriguez to get this one done. I say he uh, manages to hang an L on Dilgarian for the very first time. I say he gets it done by decision. Okay, guys, we move on up the card to 205 pounds, where Kennedy and Zechiku will be going up against Ovince St. Pru. Minus 500 betting favorite for Kennedy and Zechiku and plus 380 for OSP. Hard to believe that once upon a time, OSP fought John Jones for the light heavyweight title, but um, it's been quite the fall off for OSP. There is no other way of uh, stating, stating that facts are facts. OSP, a loss against Philip Lins. I talked about this fight last week. Philip Lins unloaded a beautiful cross on OSP and OSP quit immediately. He had a, a split decision victory over Shogun almost a couple years ago. And then he gets finished by Tanner Bozier and uh, Jamal Hill. The Jamal Hill, you know, not not the worst loss in the world to take, but we're seeing a pretty disturbing track record for OSP. We see him get finished in three out of his last four. Probably not the best look. He goes up against Kennedy and Zechiku. He was doing well. Win over Carl Robinson, a win over Ion Kutalaba, and then a win over Devin Clark. And then he dropped his most recent fight against Dustin Jacoby. Um, losing to J Dustin Jacoby, um, not the worst look in my opinion. He's a tricky guy, a very proficient, uh, kickboxer and he's a tough out. I think Dustin Jacoby's like one of the, one of the more underrated fighters in this weight class. So I actually bet on Dustin Jacoby for this fight because I thought this was going to be a tough, uh, fight for Kennedy and Zechiku, but guys, the odds are what they are for a reason. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this fight. Kennedy and Zechiku will win this fight. It's just a matter of when is he going to figure out a way to get it done. He's a dynamic striker. This guy's a thumper. And OSP, even at uh, plus 380, I cannot do that. I think OSP should probably retire. I think his best days are, are well behind him. And I have not seen anything as of late that suggests to me that he has a path forward uh, for victory. 
Maybe he gets a takedown. Maybe he gets that OSP Von Flu choke that he's famous for. But that would it would take Kennedy and Zechiku making a pretty terrible mistake in order for OSP to win this fight. This is a fight I'm staying far away from. At minus 500, I mean, even for Kennedy and Zechiku going up against OSP, yes, he will win this fight, but I just don't... I, I think it's too much risk, uh, too little reward at these odds. Kennedy and Zechiku should win this fight. I say he figures out a way to end it by first round knockout, but I am not betting on this fight. I, to me, it's just not worth it. Kennedy and Zechiku, first round knockout, and I hope this is the last time we see OSP at this level of competition. In fact, I hope we never see OSP fight again, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but at 40 years old, with the res with this recent track record, it, all, all signs point to uh, OSP. Probably should think about hanging it up. All right, guys, we move on to the co-main event where Brian Battle will be going up against Ang Lusa in a really exciting clash at welterweight. Brian Battle and Lusa, they have uh, won two out of their last three. So both these guys have been delivering on the goods as of late. Brian Battle gets a submission victory over AJ Fletcher in his most recent fight. And then prior to that, he knocks out Gabe Green. And for Lusa, a win over Cage Warriors champion. Reese McKee, and then a decision victory over AJ Fletcher. So they do have an opponent in common in the Ghost, who is no longer with the promotion. I'm going to bring it back to Battle. He was a minus 190 betting favorite in this fight against Fletcher. He uh, gets clipped with an elbow late in the first, and some commentators thought Fletcher took the first, and I'm okay with that. I can understand why. So he he ended up getting caught a little bit, but he rebounded and uh, basically was able to outgrapple A.J. Fletcher and uh, find the finish in the second. So, you know, we saw him make the adjustments. We saw him regroup and uh, really take it to Fletcher in the second. Uh, a, a good adjustment on Battle's part. The uh, Gabe Green fight, Gabe Green, questionable, questionable decision-making in this fight. He just completely, he, he didn't really have a game plan. He just wanted to brawl with Brian Battle. He uh, pressured him right from the beginning and and just started recklessly teeing off on battle and battle maintained his composure and just countered Gabe, Gabe green with a right hook and uh, green gets slept immediately. So um, terrible fight IQ for Gabe green in this fight. If I'm being uh, quite honest for Lusa, the um, striking power against Reese McKee definitely stood out. He found success uh, getting on the inside against a uh, tall, rangy guy like Reese McKee. And uh, this is a very solid performance for him. I actually bet on Reese McKee to get this one done. And uh, Lusa uh, foiled those plans. But hey, can't take anything away from Lusa. It was a uh, very impressive performance on his end. A clear decision on him, a clear decision for him. Prior to that, he goes to decision against AJ Fletcher. There was a sketchy moment in the second where AJ just unloads on Lusa, which was concerning to me. And over the course of that fight, I just kind of like got the sense that Lusa was easing up off the gas pedal a little bit, especially in the third. And when I put these two together, I think Brian Battle's the more well-rounded guy. I think he, um, I like his size. I like his reach. Uh, I like his uh, stopping power as well. The one thing I noticed is uh, I dug in the stats, and if you look at uh, Lusa's striking stats, he gets hit a lot. And the uh, strikes landed versus the strikes absorbed. Like, he gets hit more than what he's dishing out. And I don't like that, especially against somebody like Brian Battle. Um, to me, this seems like a very favorable matchup for Brian battle and battle at minus minus one fifty. Uh, I'm all over that. I think, um, I think Brian battles, just the better fighter all, 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 all around. And, uh, I have no, I have no reservations about betting on Brian battle for this fight. I don't think he's going to finish Anglusa though. Um, I think Brian battle by decision is the right call. And that's what I'm going to be doing for this fight. But, uh, I like Brian battle here. I think that's the right side. All right, guys, we are on the main event. Tai Tuivasa will be going up against Marcin Taibura. Tuivasa, the ninth-ranked heavyweight contender, and then the Polish fighter is the 10th-ranked contender. 
odds somewhat close to Ivasa, the minus 130 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Tybura plus 110. Fun fact, uh, Tuivasa is my wife's favorite fighter in the UFC. She loves this guy. Uh, she likes the uh, pop music walkout. She likes the uh, chugging beers out of the shoes. And she finds him to be a pretty charming individual. Now, what that says about me, I don't know. We're going to move on. He fights Marcin Tybura. Tybura uh, dropped his last fight against Tom Aspinall. And then prior to that, he beats Blagoy Ivanov and Alexander Romanov. Taito Ivasa has been on a skid as of late. Drops fights against Alexander Volkov. Another one here against Sergei Pavlovic. And then another one against Cyril Gan. Volkov was on was in complete control of the first round. And then eventually the fight makes it down to the ground where Volkov is able to get an Ezekiel choke in the second round. Um, the one thing I noticed about this one was uh, Tai Tuivasa uh, was very successful with the uh, low kicks in this fight, and he really beat up uh, Volkov's lead leg. That was definitely something I noticed, so a, a positive thing for him. Uh, despite not getting the result, he did show um, some other things, not just uh, boxing combinations, but very, very successful with the low kicks. And we'll see if that's a factor against Marcin Tybura. Uh, Tybura, he was brought in to lose to Tom Aspinall. Tom Aspinall dropped that fight against Curtis Blades. He ends up getting hurt. He was brought in to lose. So I uh, this is a, a loss I don't really look too much into. What is Tybora's track record against somebody that likes to brawl? And when we do the old tapology scrub here, we see that he's gone up against a few different brawlers. Greg Hardy, brawler. Ben Rothwell, brawler. Derek Lewis, brawler. He has experience going up against guys like this in the past. Now, it doesn't always work out but he's shown a track record of knowing what he needs to do to hang in there. Now, the alarming thing is he has gotten finished five times. And that's the thing I, I, you have to worry about is like, okay, well, you know, is he going to end up getting freaking clipped by Tai Tuivasa? Cause seemingly that's Tai's only shot at winning this fight, right? He doesn't go to decision. He it, it, it's 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 all or nothing with Taito Ivasa. He either gets the knockout or he loses the fight. And ultimately, that's the that's the concern I have about Taito Ivasa is yes, this is a fight he could win because Taibura is a very beatable guy, but at minus one thirty, betting him at minus one thirty with only one real path of victory is getting that knockout. That is where I have concerns because Tybura to me is the more effective grappler. He is not the more powerful striker. We have to give uh, that to Tuivasa, but this to me is a fight that I think Tybura can win. Tybura's fought tons of guys like Tai Tuivasa before, and he's able to uh, go the full 15 minutes with them. And guys, that's what I see happening here. I'm going to surprise some people. I'm taking Tybora. I think he's the more well-rounded guy. Uh, it is a risk taking him. I know that because I do know exactly the type of threat Tuivasa brings to the table. But Tuivasa, let's just be real. I like the guy. Uh, great personality. A fun dude to watch, but not very good. Kind of one-dimensional. Needs to, needs to starch his opponents or he loses. And... I can't get behind that at minus 130. I'm okay betting Tai Tuivasa as an underdog. And I've done it many times before. It hasn't always worked out for me. And he is the type of guy, because of his power, he's a threat to win any fight that he's in. But at minus 130, guys, I just cannot do Tai Tuivasa at minus 130. And Marcin Tybura, if you're going to give him to me at plus 110, I'll take that all day, every day. I think he is the more well-rounded fighter. As long as he doesn't get clipped by Taito Ivasa, I like his chances, and I'm willing to take a gamble at plus 110 on that one. I'm going to look for him to uh, make it a boring fight and to uh, basically outpoint Taito Ivasa. Maybe he gets a submission 
that is certainly a possibility, and that's something that I've been thinking about. Um, but he hasn't really got one lately, and a lot of his fights have been going the distance. And that's what I see happening here, guys. I'm going to go with Tybor to get this one done by decision, and that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. So in this fight, on this fight card, we pick some dogs, we pick some betting favorites, and I want to know which fights do you think I got wrong? Feel free to tell me in the comments. I'm never bent out of shape when everyone, when people have different opinions than me. I want to know how you guys see these fights going down. And also tell me uh, which ones did you think I got right? Where do we agree? Where do we disagree? I want to know your feedback. So please put that in the comments. And thank you guys for watching this episode. And I'll see you next week.